Good afternoon, everybody. And last time we saw the reverse quaftas in the way how we start from the uh, nutrient response data. In our case, it was nutrient omission data. And to go back to uh, the, no, to get the soil, the indigenous soil nutrient supply, the NPK of the soil using, using quests. The scripts are shared uh, from the Git. And those of you, uh, I sent email out last time to to uh, to have your username on on a Git. So those of you who do not have access for the scripts we we are developing so far, uh, just send me email me your username on on a Git, and then I will just add you as a collaborator to the project. And then you will have the whole the whole data set. Uh, what I want to cover today is then. Since we have for our trial sites the the soil indigenous nutrient supply, the NPKs. Now I wanted to do the random forest model, uh, where on the trial sites the NPK will be as a response to all the other parameters, all, all the other variables we have. We develop that model, and then we will apply that model for the whole uh, target area. Uh, to get the soil, the soil INS, uh, the uh, indigenous nutrient so soil supply for the target area. If we get that, then we can go and do the current yield estimation and then the, the fertilizer recommendation. So if you remember last time we did for actually Burundi, Rwanda and the RC data, that was the one that we used to, to generate the soil INS. And then we immediately validated it by estimating what would be then the control yield given the soil nitrogen NPK that we estimated is correct, right? And what you see here is for the Nigeria and Tanzania data. I was doing some other job, so I just left left it here. Uh, that just to refresh your 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 memory that the Queft is working starting from yield and going back to the soil NPK is working very well. And today we, we will start what we have here is the blobs for Nigeria. And you see here, these are the soil parameters that we get from ISDA together. It comes at the end. Here we do have the soil NPK that we, that we estimated for for the area. This is still for the trial sites, right? And then um, we do have the yeah the region, the control. The control, as I said last time, if you remember, we don't use it as a continuous variable. We don't use it the measured control value because at the end of the day, the control we are going to use as a covariate when we estimate the soil NPK for a specific farmer out there. And that specific farmer, when you ask him his control yield, he might not tell you that mine was 9.7 ton and the other one telling you 10.2 ton. They don't know it even, let alone in, 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 a digit, in, in that level of continuity. Um, they, they, they cannot relate them themselves so much with, with that kind of specificity, but they are very much capable in telling you in class if you if you classify it. And for cassava, it is depending on the crop and the location performance, how you create the, the classes are you look into what kind of control yield performance you you were having in that area. In your in your trial, in, just within the data set that you have, you just make a histogram of the control yield, and then you see that that what kind of classes will be, kind of it is it is a feel and an expert knowledge kind of thing, right? What would you call a very poor soil with a very low control, a kind of averageish, and a kind of a fertile? If you want to, if there is a, a lot of continuity, at least classify it into three. In our data set, we classify it into five. The more distinct class you have, the more accurate will be your your estimation. The more valuable will be the control the control uh, class yield class as a covariate, because you're capturing more and more variance with it as more classes you have. As more and more it is aggregated. 
its value will, will decrease, but still it will be substantially useful. Then all other soil data and other covariates you have that you feed in into your random forest model. So in our case, uh, maybe if I find that data slide, I will I will send you. We could we could the agronomists and the field experts and the farmers together, the users, they could come up with five classes. And these five classes are quite ra rather, you know, something like uh, anything between uh, below 7.5 ton of fresh cassava root is considered as low. Between 7.5 and like 12-ish, I think 12, 12 or 11 point something, but anyway, 12, between 7 and 12, let us say, between 7 and 12, it is like a standard kind of data. Most people are getting like 8, 9, 10. So if you are between 7 and 12, you are a very normal data that you have. When it is slightly in a better, a better uh, class, not really fertile, but better than the average thing, that was between 12 and 18 ton. There were a good deal of farmers that were getting that were falling into that, that class. But it is distinct, you know, for a farmer, if you go and ask him, were you getting between seven and 12 or between 12 and 18? If you, even if you take just the middle thing, was your, was your yield about nine, 10 ton, or it was about 14, 15 ton, it is easier for them. The, the difference is large, they can tell you, then the class could be picked. So like that, we do have five control classes. That is what you see here in the data, this control class, class four and so on and so on, that is defined based on, I think somewhere, where did I define it? Ah, here, here you see it. Um, so, okay, 18, no, 15 it is. 7.5, 7.5 to 15, 15 to 22.5, 22.5 to 33, and above 33. There are farmers who are getting about 40 tons. Uh, and in really, really well-managed uh, trial, one of our PhD students, she even could get 90 tons of uh, cassava per hectare. But that is like extraordinary. You know, she, she was putting 300 nitrogen on a hectare and something like that. So nobody does that one, but this is our class. So for your own use, you will create your own, your own, your own class and you created that one. So once we read that, what we have now is done for a random forest model, we need our soil N, soil P, soil K, because these are the response variables. So soil N is going to be, um, fitted in the random forest model with all the covariates that we could get from ISDA soils, the, the variables are there, plus the region and the control class, not the control, both N, P, and K are then like that. But if you do this, for instance, for Ethiopia, and if you don't have digital elevation model, something of the elevation in it, you know, it it, it, it it won't be that good. So what I want to say is these covariates are not by definition what has to be there for every every other situation. Depending on your situations, there are important covariates you put together. As many useful covariates as you have, you can add. So uh, the next step that we see here is probably, wait, let me just run this one as well. Um, I'm splitting the data. I'm splitting the, the data 70-30. Therefore, I will use the 70% of the data I have for, for um, to fit the model, and the 30% I will use it as as a validation as a validation set. So, I have a little function here. I split them, and then I am dropping. Um, I'm on this level now. I'm dropping for. Uh, nitrogen data, the training data for a nitrogen, I'm dro dropping P and K, uh, which is just yeah, like that. From both the training and the validation, I dropped the variables that I don't need because when I fit soil N, I'm not putting soil P and soil K as a covariate. Soil N is a response. All the other parameters except soil P and soil K, those, those shouldn't be part of, part of the figure. And then it is just I'm, 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 I'm running my random forest model at this point. Mm, 
Here is the random forest model, soil in with everything that I have with 4,000 uh, trees. And if you see it, I do have for soil nitrogen about the R square is about 0 0.9. And if you look at into the variance importance, maybe I will zoom it in, you will see immediately how much the control class is taking, you know. Almost, almost all, all the information you are getting is actually from the control class. And a little bit of the region, because in the region I do have, uh, it's not only Nigeria and Tanzania, but within Nigeria as well, we do have south and east, uh, south and west and east, and in Tanzania we do have other three regions that we, we define. They are based on the agroecological zone, they are different, so that also brings in, brings in a data. So when you see the, the rest of the, the soil parameters, they are not really impressively adding any value. And that is because we tested it in, in, in many, many different ways. Actually, we were playing with that. How much is the soil data adding a value in this analysis? And it's basically because from, from, from how Isric was taking the sample, at what distance between actual samples, and after that, how much extrapolation was in between. And if you just look at it, the, the, the map that they are providing as well, you immediately will understand that the reason why the soil data is not adding that much value is because on a short on in, in a short range, you don't see really a lot of local variation in those soil maps. It is highly smoothened out. They are highly um, between 10 and 15 kilometers, there is highly a variation in the soil property because of the extrapolation, because of the, the data density behind it, right? Otherwise, actually, in actual sense, there is difference in the soil property, but especially when, when the elevation is very rugged, the, the soil property will also be equally highly variable, but it is highly smooth in the data that we have that we cannot expect to get a lot of added value from the soil. Nevertheless, they are the soil data is important to capture regional differences. And for that regional differences, our coverage of the nutrient omission data is not that dense, is not that regular, is not covering all the representative sites that we want, right? The, these are very expensive things, so you do it on a selected area. So by bringing the learnings or the data power from your trial site and you add the soil data bringing in, bringing you into contributing into capturing the regional variation that is why you put them all 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 together um so yeah so we we do have we know now we do have a model here this wait this model here random forest nb this uh, why don't uh, yeah this this model here here is the training that the model that is trained for us based on, on the trial sites. And that is what this model is, what we are going to use later on the farmer's field, because by, 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 by using this model, we will be able to predict the soil N on the farmer field. The same thing can be done for soil as, as, as it is done for soil N, I can do it here for soil P. And I can also do it here for soil K. So I already will have the new model that I will use on farmer's field on for to capture any PK. Maybe I can also run this one. This one will be the the prediction will be like this because you remember uh, uh, you're listening to me, right? <laughs> Give me a sign. Yes. Are you there? Okay, <laughs> that's good. So uh, we, at the beginning, we did 70-30, right? We used only 70% of the data to uh, to train our model. So I use the other 30%. That is what I'm doing here in end data validation blob, the predicted N using this model, the RFNP predict, use that model and use the data set, the 30% of data set that I set apart as a validation set, right? So by doing that, for that 30%, I already will get them the, the, the predicted N. And, and 
the validation result will look like this. So what you see here is on the X axis, you do have the soil and for that when we split the 30% of the data, it already has a soil N we estimated from the river squares. At the river squares, if, if we have 100 data sets, uh, an, an, an NOT data set, it went through first the river squares, all the 100. So all those 100 pointers do have a soil N, soil P and soil K we get from river squares. Now I came to Ragnar Forest, I split it into, I took only 70% of the data, 70 data pointers, and I fit it through random forest model to get what? To get soil N. Soil N as a response to the soil parameters and the control class. That is what the training model does. Now I bring into the, the 30 data pointers that are remaining, and I said, OK, I want to validate how good this model is giving me the soil. I, I gave it to the model that is trained by the 70 data pointers. I, I, told, I asked him, give me your prediction of soil. A. And it gave me that prediction. So for that 30 data pointers, example, this, these pointers are much more than 30. For those 30 data pointers on the X axis, I put for you the soil N I get from river squares. On the Y axis, the soil N that I get through the random forest model. And there is, it is, it is, it is logical that some pointers are really, really off. It could be because the, the soil data on those points are absolutely not useful. It could be that even the control data that we have on those area were completely off not 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 representative of the area how the, the when you compare it relative to the soil property information that we get for that area and the control response we get for that area they might be off from each other for several reasons so if we just forget about the few pointers that we see here these four points are completely off for most of the the area Actually, it's not really very bad. The, the line is a one-to-one -one line, so it is not really very bad. So for our location, we are a kind of happy uh, that, OK, the random forest model, that is the, the NPK that we could get from random forest model is reasonably good, reason, close to what we saw from the river squares. And from the river squares, we already saw, showed by validating it for the control yield that it was very good. So yeah, by implication, the soil, the random forest model, what where we are getting from there is good enough to capture local variance. At this point, you know, what is good enough for me is as long as it gives me, my ultimate aim is giving a site specific fertilizer recommendation. And for that, I should be able to differentiate with areas that with, with, with different combination of biophysical factors, right? That is what I need. Just improve from the, the blanket recommendation and refine it as much as possible. Therefore, variations from I mean, locations with variable biophysical nature will get different risk will will I will be able to tell they do have different responses. I will be able to tell you need to use different label of input. And that is what I'm seeing here. I can I I am able to differentiate. I will be able to give site specific recommendation. Maybe within you know within within one kilometer the differences I would make might be nonsense and I don't mind as long as I, I improved substantially on the on the on the recommendation specificity. Um, so th this is the part of the the, the random forest model, model. What we do, the next step is exactly what we did in these two point, in these two lines for all the three. So now I validated it, right? And I do have a good R square, R square and I do have a good correlation of the soil and from river square to some random forest model. 
So the next step I will do is, OK, actually now the model works reasonably. I don't need to split my data into 70, 30. I can use the whole data I have from my nutrient omission trial to train my random forest model. And after that, I will take this model trained by a complete data set and my Validation data set will be not a subset of my nutrient omission trial data, but the location where I want prediction, right? The soil data from the farmer's field, which means if it is for, for Nigeria, my 12,000 points, which I created on a regular grid, for which I have soil data, rainfall data, whatever, whatever data. So for those locations, that will be now my validation data. And I will ask him, give me a predicted N for my target pointers, my 12,000 pointers. Predict my, my soil N using the model trained by complete nutrient omission trial data I have. And I will give you all the parameters you need to predict my soil in the soil, the is the soils and the control classes. But the control class on the farmer's field, here it is very important that you understand this. The control class on the farmer's field, now when I am pre-calculating it, I don't know. I don't know what a farmer X will tell me. So when this this analysis analysis is heading into incorporating into the Aquilimo app. My work actually here it is finished. I don't go further. I will just put this document, this script is within the Akilimo app. And then it is in real time when the farmer or the extension agent is using the Akilimo app, asking what is your yield and getting the yield class. That yield class will pass. And then from the app itself, the yield class will pass. But at the back end, I do have for that uh, specific uh, longitude and latitude, I do have all the soil and so and so data. It will merge it together. It will fit the random forest model. It will go on. But if we are using for other purpose, other than the, the Akili MOAP, to generate maps and tables, or for the Arifu, um, whatever it is, uh, the chatbot, or the IVR. For all those ones, we need pre-calculated um, uh, recommendations, right? So to get a pre-calculated recommendation, what I am going to do is, for every longitude and latitude uh, pair I have, for every spot, I'm going to assume this farmer can have any of the five yield class I have. Therefore, I have to calculate five times. For every yield class I have, I'm going to estimate if he says yield class one, this will be the soil nitrogen. If he says yield class five, this will be the soil nitrogen. And you can you can already deduce from that that how would I at the end of the day if you want to really uh, you know, control every step if you are doing, especially at the beginning when you do this, you need to you need to check and cross check every after doing one step. You have to see if the result you get really makes sense. So what you do is for uh, class one, two, three, four, five, you generate soil in one, two, three, four, five, soil P, soil K, like that. And it should it should be that. When a farmer say my soil is class one, poor soil, which is his, if his control is poor, the soil N should be the least. And as the yield class increases, your soil N should also increase because it must be that he has more nutrients in his soil, more his soil is more fertile, that it will give him for, because the rainfall will be at that point constant, right? For that farmer at that location, what would vary that you don't know would be? Yeah, okay, the rainfall as well, we don't know. Eh? But that one, we fixed it, we avoided it, or actually it is a little bit of cheating at the same time because we are considering what is the maximum yield, the water, what the water limited yield. But when you say the water limited yield, even water limited yield, yeah, from year to year, it is variable, right? So what we did is we ran it for three years and we took the maximum. But 
ideally, probably we have to run it for the last 20 years if the, the computation capacity allows and then see the variation on those 20 years. And we have to do something. We have to account for that variation when we set the water limit yield. But that is the next step that, that hopefully this team will bring it to. But at this point, on the when we come back to the, the soil INS, what we exactly now doing with the random forest model, it is the soil nutrient supply we want to estimate. We're going to estimate it for five class. And after that, it will be a lookup table. At the end of the day, whether it is be a map or be a, a chatbot, it will be that the database behind it for every location will have five different scenarios that you one of the very key question we, we have to get the data from the user would be on farmer's current yield, we call it for them. Uh, what is your your control yield label? And based on that, on the lookup table, then you pick one of the five to to go on further in the, in the analytics. Um, is that clear? Mekli, I have a question here. Yeah. Because uh, uh, you mentioned there is some uh, some uh, uh, real time uh, processing uh, and other that it's a lookup table, but uh, I am not sure if that uh, I got that uh, right. That uh, there is a certain uh, apps that uh, that that are uh, referring to pre-calculated data and others that are live. Uh, is yeah. that correct? Just to go. OK, OK. So now in, in Akilimo, we do have the chatbot and we do have the mobile app. Eh? Mm -hmm. If I take only two of them, those two are different and they differ from this point on. For the Akilimo, for the Akilimo app, it will take the farmer current yield on the field. The moment it gets that farmer's current yield, any any kind of analysis we do from here on, the one I am yet to explain, all that will be done within the app in real time on the Akilimo server it runs. Mm -hmm. So it, it will say uh, my yield level is 10 ton. Immediately it is translated into he is yield class two. And that data will come into the Akilimo server. And then it takes the soil data, it takes the water limited yield, it takes the fertilizer types, prices and so on, and it combines and gives it a fertilizer recommendation there. But when you come to the chatbot, the chatbot doesn't have at the back end that kind of computation. Okay. It is it is a lookup table. It works based on a lookup table. So all the, the, the equation that it is asking to the user, what is it, it asks the same question. What is your control yield? You will see it both in the chatbot and in the Akilimo app. But in the Akilimo app, the input is directly going into computation and it triggers uh, a process to compute. But within a chatbot, it is creating a lookup key. It is saying uh, he is in this. It doesn't even work on longitude and latitude. In the chatbot, it works. It is aggregated and it works on uh, on a local government area kind of thing, mm -hmm. um, or a, a district, or this kind of aggregated uh, a location name. So he, he is then making a lookup key. This user is on that region, and. And um, uh, fertilizer type as well. It is a kind of a choice you will be given when you come mm -hmm. to the, the 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 chatbot. He will say, "I do have urea. I do." Have, he says he has urea. He has DAP, and he has this fertilizer. Um, his current yield is the same, eh? ten ton. Then he's class two. So immediately it creates a lookup key. And in the data set already for that location, assuming this person has yield class one, the computation is all done and the fertilizer, what, what recommendation to be given is already put there in one row. A second row is for the same location, the same user. If in case his yield class is two, 
there is another recommendation. This class like that, uh, five scenarios for five classes, five rows are there for that specific location. Mm -hmm. And based on yield class two, he just from the lookup PC and he picked the row. That's that is already have the result in some column down the line for class two. So in that way, when we are for a chatbot, all the computation that we are going to discuss from here are already run now. Mm -hmm. And the database of the recommendation on the lookup, the lookup key is together given as a flat file to Arifu. And Arifu is reading this file from the back end to pick recommendation, but they don't do calculation. Is it a bit clear? It's totally clear. I I I, I see. Okay, so there is two, yeah, two different uh, uh, backends. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Like uh, the IVR as well is working like that. The mm -hmm. with the Viamos Ritu and the the IVR, the person is on the phone and it shouldn't it shouldn't take two minutes from end to end. It shouldn't normally. So they are, uh, if you're Current yield is uh, between 7 and 15, press 1. If it is between 15 and Anna, press 2. At that point, he presses. And then at the back end of Yamu, it is um, a decision tree is there. It is on the junction on the decision tree to divide, to, to, to choose a direction which yield, yield class he has. So if he says, it, if he chooses 1, and if it matches to yield the class one yield the class one yes no yes then it is already going on to that yes direction if it is no it goes to the other like that it splits the based on the decision criteria and at the end it picks a certain package but that package already is computed and already labeled on the decision tree it is already there while in the mobile application it will do and that is also the problem because this computation, like for the IVR and so on, because they are pre-calculated, the fertilizer types, the fertilizer prices, um, investment capacity, these things are already taken on a certain assumption at the default value. And if there is a huge swing on the on the market values, this thing is, you know, you will have to keep on adapting it. And that is a lot of work. While in the mobile application, no problem. From here on, it is hands on, hands off. It is a script who is taking care of it. And for that script, you can give it any price at that point in real time, then that is uh, easier. And that is why actually in EI as well, we have to go to the API versions. Therefore, we will have, uh, uh, they can read from the API and present it in, in whatever form they want. But at least we will provide them a solution where it is completely flexible to handle uh, market market price fluctuations. Yeah. Yes, I I I agree. Yes, that it makes it much more dynamic. Uh, yeah. yeah. Can I yeah. ask a question here, Meklet? Which yes, please. Uh, um, and I know that uh, Wuletau has questions too, but let let me ask mine and then. Well, why don't you ask? Um, why don't Why don't you answer Willie Dawu first? He he's written in the chat. Current yield. Oh. He wants to know if current yield is the same as historical yield from previous years, and he wants to know if it's static from year to year. Um, current yield at at this point for cassava it is easier. <laughs> it is because farmers do not use fertilizer. It is just a yield level without fertilizer historically. So they can. A smart farmer might, you know, think about all the fluctuations in the good year and the bad year and gives you an average thing. Otherwise, you might kind of trigger them to think that way. But what is a kind of average yield they have been getting? For cereals like what I was working on wheat, I don't think there is a farmer who is doing wheat without fertilizer at this point. So for them, it will be what will be a historical average kind of yield they were getting? That will be our control. Olato, well, did I answer your question? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. How, how, you know, if 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 there's some 
uh, calamity that happens during the season, the price, you know, there's a huge change in, in anticipated price. Um, how does that come come in? I mean, in, I think probably in most countries we work in, there is no sort of central place where you can go and with an API that will give you real time prices, etc. So is it it's manual input or how, how, how do you how do you handle that? Yeah. Um, so when it is in the app, no problem. If you have an app or an API solution that you are giving, you leave it open. That is no problem because from the point on we trained our random forest model for the API or the app solution, it is handed off. It is a generic script we, that is working behind the app. And you give it the, your price there, your fertilizer, even fertilizer types can be absolutely flexible. It doesn't need to be a list of fertilizers that are now now available on the farmer. But if someone comes with a completely new blend, as long as they give the N, P and K elemental comp proportion in, within that fertilizer, you give it any name, it works like that. So that is that is the easy part. If we are working that way, we can leave it open and for the price they give us, we compute and we tell them it is profitable. It is not profitable. No problem. Right. But, but the you... price is given by the farmer. Yeah. What they expect. That's yeah. the only that's the only input then is the farmer's input on what they expect to get. Yeah. On the farmers, they have to tell you what kind of fertilizers they have and what price they pay for a 50 kilogram bag of a fertilizer for each one and how much they would expect when at the time of harvest, when they plan to harvest, how much they expect to get on their on their crop price per ton. How much do you expect in the future? That is the thing. And their control yield, of course. Uh, so, and so, how much sorry, Michael, are, just to yeah. just to clarify on that, though, I mean, they're telling you how much they expect to get based on what they've gotten in the past. But yeah. if there's wild fluctuations uh, for one reason or another, um, that that you know the the they wouldn't be able to correct their estimation or or i mean we don't have any way of of accounting for that right and with unpredictable weather no. which is what we're trying to address in yeah. many of our uh, in much of our work uh we don't we won't be able to help in that regard right no we can't uh, like for instance for cassava there was a year that um, a farmer, the Nigerian government was encouraging so much farmers to go on grow rice and maize instead of cassava. They discouraged it so much. And at the time of harvest, cassava, those who still insist and plant their cassava, it hits to the price of 70 up to from 70 to 80,000 naira per kilogram. And the next year, the farmers the others saw that actually they would have been a lot more better off if they had cassava, everybody planted cassava. And at the time of harvest, it planted into five to seven thousand from 70 to 80,000 per ton to five to seven thousand per ton. It just crashed completely and cassava is not something you can harvest and store. If you harvest it in three days, if you don't sell it, it ferments, it rots, you're, you're done, you're gone. So it is. Uh, it, it it really has a huge painful consequences for them. Uh, luckily, you you can leave the cassava in the plant without harvesting and count few months further. But if you need the money, you are you are done with that, right? So, but for from for us, the price they tell us now today, we have to we have to evaluate. If we are going to ask them to invest their money on this on this field or not, and for that we have to have a certain certain reference to what will be the the response on this on this investment. But what we can do that I see in the future, uh, the next step is probably we should ask the worst the worst case scenario. In average, when the farmer, the, the, the market is not really mad, up or down. If we have the three versions, we could compute the, for the recommendations for the three versions for them and at least get them aware, give them, give them the decision lies still with them on which one they bet their, 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 their money on, where they put their money on. 
But if the price is as low as the lowest you know, you maybe should not invest, uh, or your response, your uh, your your profit will shrink by that much. Uh, if it is a normal year, as you say, you will that kind of maybe an educative information we can give them. But otherwise, market is wild for them as well for us. Yeah, no, that's that's exactly along the lines of what I was thinking when I asked the question. Uh, but your solution is much more elegant than what I was thinking about. I think it's much simpler, um, and it allows you then, you know, with you you re referred to lookup tables, and I suppose the Viamos and Arifus of the world could, uh, you know, ideally what they would do then is to is to change their outlook right and to let farmers know at least to manage expectations so that it's not the tool or their advice that's being blamed in the end it's it's kind of a an advisory that comes in the middle of the season saying look this is what we you know we this is unanticipated this is what we expect now given blah 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 whatever it is that's happened um which would i think be be more in line with managing expectations and not that you can do anything when the cassava's <laughs> already half grown but at least you know, in terms of, uh, you, you know, the the trust in the in the in the in the in the tool and the recommendations would probably be improved. So anyway, that's my that's my little two cents. Yeah, well, that's a big one. <laughs> yeah, and 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 probably what we can do is we could actually like the an, in a mid season kind of advisory we can create where all this modeling that we have been doing so far will not be done but only purely the the price comparison only now what we what we what it does is somewhere in mid season they can give their current price or the projection to the to the harvest probably will be more realistic as they are getting closer give those price and let's again you know run the loop to see if the profitability is still OK, pro because any additional or we could save them from any additional investment. For instance, if, it, if the market is going to crash completely, any herbicide or anything they were yet going to do labor where they were still going to uh, spend on, on the farm. Don't don't spend on that one. Let the crop do whatever it can do and just, you know, cut your costs. Or probably they can do more to even take care of it and to get more out of it. That that we can do. Um, yeah. Any moment they can run that small, very fast, highly optimized, small um, script at the at the at the back end. Just takes prices, run, and re-evaluate the profitability. Yeah. So I will take you then the, ne the next step. Uh, on the next step, OK, now I'm from Aka, I'm coming back to Burundi data, but it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, the, the concept remains. Here is, as I, as I told you, for instance, if I show you, let me read this data. For every lo longitude and latitude, every time when you see this 0 20 20 to 50 immediately you know it is uh, is that data right all the is that data carbon organic whatever whatever everything that we can get the land cover uh, the crop cover the slope angle whatever we can get right until here and after that i just created now this is for the whole burundi target area i am i am moving into the farmers field right i created three three uh, columns you see it here as well soil n soil p soil k and at this point they are na I, they don't have value i'm going to use the random forest model that i developed just a few minutes ago to generate that one but i'm going to do that for five yield class this is what you see now fcy fcy is farmer current yield we call it the control fcy one two fcy one five and what will be the difference is oh back what will be the difference will be the control yield I will give will be different in in for FCY one. My control yield class will be for all the pointers class one for FCY five for all the pointers. My control yield is I'm going to tell it saying it is class five. 
that's all. And by saying class one and class five, how he how it does differentiate it is the model, the random forest model that we trained had a control yield class between class one and class five, because on our nutrient omission trial data, the 600 something data we have for Akai, we have a control yield measured. And this control yield, when I classify them into five classes, they gave me all sorts of all the five I have, good amount of data in every class. So that is why the model, the trained model, when I tell it class one, in, and especially the soil class, the not the soil, the, the control yield class having such a huge importance in the model, we, we saw it on the variance importance uh, plot I showed you, that when you say class one and when you say class two, class three, the influence is feel you feel it it will be felt you it will be seen it will be obvious right so um and as you see it here that is what i'm explaining you for the fcy1 the control class is set at class two just like that for for fcy5 the class five is set right and then um, I do have my train data. The train data is the complete data set that I have, right? From my nutrient omission data. I created my classes of the soil, um, the slope angle I, I dropped because I don't have it completely for data set. That is one shortcoming of actually, two shortcomings of ran random forest model. One is if it misses, even if you have 30 covariates, and it misses the data for one of the 30 covariates, that row it will drop. You will not have an estimation for that. It has to be complete. The data set should be complete, no missing lesson. And the second one is it doesn't go out of range. If you are estimating uh, soil nitrogen, now the soil nitrogen, the one that I had in the, um, in the training model, when I applied it, to predict for my target area, the soil nitrogen probably I will have pocket of land in my target area, which are extremely poor, poorer than the data, the, 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 the soils, kind of soils I had within my training set, or a lot richer than what I have in my control, in my training set, but it doesn't go. So it, it will be your soil nitrogen will be within the range of um, the soil nitrogen you have in your training data set. That is the kind of problem random forest has. But it didn't really influence a lot. Um, that is why the representativeness of the data set that you have for your target area is quite important. In our case, all the data we have were the nutrient omission data came from actually the area where we want to give site specific recommendation. So we are saved that way. But the danger would be when you take data from similar locations somewhere else and you bring it to, to your area, how representative it is, the variation that you see in the data from this other area, how much is that variation similar into your area that yeah there you will you will see so if you see different values uh, if it conflicts with your expert knowledge probably that is one of the hypotheses you need to you need to interrogate that is the data really representative right um so what did i do now where am i okay slope angle is dropped um I will drop the control, the bedrock uh, depths as well. I will drop it because in this data, it is almost by definition 99% of the data have a 200 centimeter depth. So yeah, it doesn't bring any, it doesn't add any value. If it is all uniform, it's not useful for my modeling. Some variation is, is needed. So that's why I'm dropping this thing here. And then uh, you see here, I have a function gate soil NPK for area of interest. And if you see up here, I am sourcing 
this function, the Queftus function. And this Queftus function is also in the in the Git uh, file, actually in the reverse Queftus Git, Git file. So the moment you send me your username, you have it. And for Joe, um, uh, Eduardo and Sia, they already they already have it. Um, so maybe I will open here Queftus Queftus function in Aquilimo modeling. I'll open it. Oh. Maclet. Yeah. Um, you may have addressed this while I had to step out briefly, but you know, early on when when you showed the the random forest uh, outputs, you yeah. said that in fact soils data was virtually useless in in determining it was not important, right? Um, yeah, it was not hugely important. Um, right. So then so, my question is, mm -hmm. if you just have you looked at this is this is I know this is not going to be make anybody very happy, but I want to ask it anyway. If you if you have you looked at running everything entirely ignoring the soils um, versus including the soils data because it it is you know it adds a layer of work and I'm just wondering. Can you, I mean, to, to what extent is that soils data really important when you, particularly when you're talking about systems where people are n not adding much fertilizer at all to begin with? Um, it's not, it, it, yeah, yeah, I'm just wondering, you yeah. know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So what is happening here is this, this question, actually, me and Peter, we discussed it so many times. <laughs> and last time he was, he was trying to, he, actually, he might finish that analysis. He was doing well, an analysis, dropping the soil completely out. So our understanding, or that's how we saw it so far, is that the, when you have the control yield class, that is really the key parameter that is telling you the variation in which condition that's, that farmer's soil, that specific farm is. Because at the end of the day, everything boils down to yield, be it Absolutely. rainfall, be it whatever, whatever. So if it tells you the yeah. yield, it tells you a lot about that, that specific yeah. location. Yep. And then what happened is that the soil's data, its importance is bringing in the regional variation. When you when you are counting between about you know a, a kilometer, five kilometer, ten kilometer, especially within five kilometer, let us say that the soil variation is not adding that much. It's not telling you that much. It is smoothened out and so on. But when you go further and if you compare uh, areas that are 15, 20 kilometer up uh, uh, far from each other. There is a certain level of regional variation information it is bringing into your data. But if you can replace that with other sort of information that you have, it could be the agroecological zone. If you have that kind of information, I also I am also very eager to see if we can, you know, completely forego the soils data. I I I would like to see that. I mean, I'm not. Yeah, I get. Uh, maybe I don't understand still. You, you know why the regional variation is so important, because if we're if we're actually giving farmers advisories on much more of a local scale, then yeah, then I I don't quite get it. I'm I'm probably missing something quite important, but I'm not certainly no, getting it. No, yeah. no. I think you are asking the right question. This is mm. something that we need to interrogate very well. Mm. Uh, and I, I don't mm. really very well looked in depth, looked, looked into this, and we should. I think we'll let that. Can I comment on yeah. this? Yeah, 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 yeah yes, please. Please. No, actually, the, the, the initially when I hear about this, uh, you know, integrating the soil, the soil fertility, map into the machine learning algorithm, I was really happy because, you know, naturally, um, the, the, the status, the soil fertility status that we have this year, uh, uh, and depending on the, the, the amount of fertilizer we applied, 
we are not going to have the same amount of fertilizer for the next year. You know, for the for the control yield, you assume the average or you know kind of historical category of yield, but uh, the fertility it has to change. You know, through time. So, like uh, in in 2015, you have particular soil status, but based on the the nature of the productivity of the area and then the fertilizer application, you want to have a new soil map for the next year and or after five years, 2020. So if, if we are not going to capture that, then even the value of uh, the, the quift model, the reverse model, I don't I don't see uh, that is really important even to integrate to, to work on doing the reverse uh, modeling of the uh, of the quift model. So, so I don't know if I if I misunderstood it, but for me, the key interesting component that I am trying to, you know, apply this with a random forest was to capture year-to-year -year soil fertility change. Because that, in my thinking, the decline in fertility based on the application of fertilizer and others need to be captured in agronomic analysis. I don't know if that makes sense. Um, probably the, the reverse I, I argue um, because in the in the reverse quests, what we are taking is the recent. If you have a yield level that is realized last year, that is the one that that you take into account, right? And and you get your soil fertility level from that one. In the random forest model, what we are taking is this digital from the digital soil maps, from the digital elevation models, and from beat rainfall and soil moisture these data are generated in certain time at a certain point uh, time some years ago or recently doesn't matter they are not uh, updated rather frequently and therefore the information that we will get from them will be rather static whether we run it today mm. or yeah i think i'm wrong I am, I I was trying to explain yes, the, I also the, think the, so. the <laughs> I was not about uh, I was not about, I was not talking about the the static data from Isrik or Isda. Yeah. I was talking about the the output of the reverse model. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Then yeah. then we 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 agree yeah. Um because the the in the in the reverse quests it is the accumulation of data that you have. And if you are in a luxurious position that for a certain location, you do have data 10 years ago, five years ago, three years ago, and last year, a kind of thing, it will be actually interesting to, to do this small exercise when we have that kind of a data set that to even evaluate how is the soil for the progress in the soil NPK that we observe. Is there is it really sensitive enough, enough to capture or a depletion or an accumulation? I don't know because it depends on the management and how, how what kind of input there was through the years. We could probably do that kind of exercise and see if it is responsive enough. But I agree, I agree with you, Wulatao, that from all these things at the end of the day, what we, we need to get is something that responds for the current soil fertility level and as much as possible simplified that these static data sets, if we once accounted for that, can we probably get all the information, we, we, we extract all the information we can extract from them and then just drop them out and take only the part of the information that we have as, as, as a component of the model in that way, simplify simplify this process of modeling. I I don't know if I am clear, but in in my head, some idea is now being brewed. I I agree with with the exercise to to check. In fact, the the reverse quift model can capture the dynamic in the soil nutrient that we try to mm -hmm. capture. So that exercise could be interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And probably in the coalition of wheeling data, we might have, you know, even yeah, if it yeah. is few location, it doesn't matter because reverse quests doesn't need a massive amount of data. It, actually, it does the, the computation location by location. So if we do have even a handful of 
location with different years yep. data, even if they are 10 yep. points, it doesn't matter. We could we could test it. Yeah, that's a good and, idea. Yeah. And that will be very interesting. We could even publish that, you know. <laughs> that, is, yes, that, is, that is one thing, very key key component in this analysis, in, in capturing the current status of the fertility. It also have an implication in the KPI analysis. You can use it, you can provide yeah, it exactly. as a small tool for KPI analysis as well. Yeah. But you need at least a few decades, I would imagine, right? You don't see those kinds of changes over a period of 10 years. No, wouldn't you? Uh, the, the, like, I don't think so. the, the available phosphorus nitrogen should be dynamic from year to year because uh, that's what, no? I would be surprised. I mean, not 10 years. It's too small the time scale, I think. I mean, I could be wrong about that, but I doubt it. Yeah. Because that, that's also... That's also a function of the, the input, you know, the, the fertilizer application and I guess. Uh, but if these have been low input systems for a long time, then yeah. Anyway, I, I could be very, very wrong and, and it, it, I'd, I'd be happy to be proved wrong in this instance. But um, given that these are relatively low input situations we're talking about, I think it, it might be difficult to just have that much. You might you might have you might be looking for longer sort of periods and we don't have Unfortunately, in many of the places we work, we don't have those kinds of long-term, well-controlled um, trials, no, that we can get that data from. I mean, so I was joking when I when I put in the chat, yeah. half joking, but not really. <laughs> it would be interesting <laughs> to to look at wheat at Rothamsted, you know, where they have hundreds of years of really yeah. great records. Yeah, really. Yeah, that would yeah. be really interesting. Because for the for the cereal system, you know. Uh, it's really input intensive, especially the the urea and the NPS in Ethiopia. And last year for AI, we wanted to do the soil sampling before uh, before the trial, but uh, we didn't manage to do it. We, we we wanted to do it in the middle of the the season after we applied the fertilizer, and people were saying, "Okay, now it's already the soil is different because we already applied the fertilizer, and it's not a baseline in any way." So. We didn't manage to collect for uh, our plots. So I, uh, during that discussion, I thought it's really somehow a bit dynamic in in, uh, in the Highland systems. Mm. Probably, you know, these uh, research centers like, uh, you know, the Siringa, Lamaya, and those things in Ethiopia, they have been there for at least 30 years, three decades, and they do have on-farm trials in their own campus that, they do year after year after year. Yeah, yeah. So if we can get, even if not the complete the last 30 years, something as old as possible and like 10 years back and 10 years and 10 years, if we could get that, we could look at that. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. yeah. We, can try, we can try to look this kind of data and see if, yeah. if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I wanted to add that um, we tell you us right that nitrogen is very dynamic, and for a person who wants to do a, a nutrient depletion trial, they advise to plant probably your maize for two seasons, and by then, um, without adding anything, uh, you assume that you'd have depleted all the available nitrogen. For plant uptake, um, so I, I for 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 nitrogen, I don't think uh, one needs like uh, so many years to to then see the dynamic downs. I think what is an issue is probably your potassium and your phosphorus, because those tend to be bound by whatever um, other um, compounds are in the soil and they might actually become slow releases uh, in them. But that also affects their availability over time. Uh, so I think for 10 years is, is, is a good start, but 30 years is more of validation and trend analysis, I think, would be also good. If we just can do for NMP, because K is a kind of 
Yeah, KK. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's in African soils, especially. Um, I think it's little to no deficit, but with yeah. NNP. Let's see if there is a data, and we will we will see. <laughs> we will see how we do that. Yeah. And for uh, to go back to Meda's question on the um, on the soil uh, data, probably uh, once all of us are back in office, um, we will ask Peter to to give us a presentation because he was specifically looking at that that how much information actually are we getting from from soil data? Can we, you know, forego it? <laughs> and it is good. Whatever he has at hand, uh, I will ask him to share it with us. Let's see. Yeah. So but, maybe to complement on this, we for the random forest we use uh, Isric. Yeah. Um, and I, I guess depending on uh, the nutrient, the the order of the the variable of importance, I. I I need to check the paper. We just published a paper. Um, I don't know. NNP was more on the climate, but P, uh, no, KNDS was related to also a bit with uh, the soil type. Not not types. So like soil texture and yeah. uh, some of uh, soil variables. So so depending on which variable we are looking, and and also maybe depending on the approach. So. Completely dropping all the soil may not may not be ideal, but uh, as uh, as you suggest, Peter, if he did something, we can also yeah. look at that. Here as well, the variable importance differ from NP and K. They didn't come all in in the same way. Bulk density, soil pH, uh, texture, those things are uh, more more useful. But for some reason, I always see zinc as well. And it doesn't seem in the literature I could find any reason for it to become important. But what I think is probably the mapping in the soil, in the soil zinc, um, I'm looking at uh, is that data, um, probably it is confounded with other parameter, with other variable that, uh, that is important but you know, it is not soil. <laughs> that is what I think of, uh, because if it comes before total nitrogen, organic carbon, uh, things like that, we are, we are always puzzled with that one. What is zinc representing in the back end? What, what is it confined, compounded with? We don't know. But yes, you're right. It is a different thing. Um, Just to complement on this. So one of the challenges with the soil data, especially with Isric, the, 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 the accuracy, the representation of actually what it, it wants to represent is a, is a problem, especially for uh, some of the... Com for some, it's good, but for the other uh, uh, parameter, it's uh, the, the model performance is like R squared 0 0.2 or 0 0.28. Yeah. And I, I always have a challenge to believe that that product is... Uh, is a product that is what is what it claims because R square zero point two is nothing. So yeah. so yeah. So it's not it's not the product, but it's the quality of the product is a challenge. Yeah, yeah. I agree. I agree. And it is true. If you drop out uh, other all other parameters, and if you feed your random forest model only to ISDA or ISRIC, your R square at best will be 0 0.35, not more than that. You cannot push it beyond that. And that 3.5, in the other analytics two, three years ago, we, we checked it that, that that is actually just a regional variation. It is not, it doesn't add anything in the local variability, but the regional variation accounts for a kind of a third of variation you see in your, in our nutrient omission data. The third of a variation, when you saw variation disaggregation, um, a third of the variation, uh, variation decomposition, I mean, uh, a third of variation comes from regional differences. And that is also what is accounted for by the soil. Um, and the other thing that the soil data has to be accounted for is when we do 
waterly material, uh, be it desat or, or isda, the soil hydraulics is accounted for. It, it, it is really very important parameter in the, in the modeling that the wilting point, the field capacity, soil saturation uh, levels, those are a, co a combination of uh, percent organic matter, texture, and pH. And pH? Yes, pH as well. pH? No, 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 not pH. pH is for soil, for soil P, uh, not pH, but it is soil organic, uh, percent soil organic matter and the texture, the composition of this. So there we are a kind of we have to use the digital soil maps, but in the in the in the uh, determining the soil INS, probably we could simplify. Yeah, this is something we should do together in the future. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think getting the soil NPK. <laughs> using uh, the gate soil we have two minutes actually i can i can i can explain it in two minutes it is not i already we already discussed it it is not more than it just it just takes the training data set and the area of interest data sets the twelve thousand data pointers for for nigeria the training data set all the not data i have in the in nigeria the current yield for every current yield it takes them yeah one yeah, it takes and a country so what he does is he fits the random forest model using the training estimates for the area of interest the data con assuming that fcy that far farmers current yield assumed as the control yield at that point for the whole country that is all it does so if you run that thing, what you get is actually the same thing, the same data set as I showed you here, but at this point, it will fill in what soil N, soil P, and soil K will look like, and for that farmer current yield. So the input data you give, if you give it 12,000 data pointers to get the soil N, P, K, the output will be times five, because for every row, you will have five different rows for the five current yield uh, control yield level, five different soil Ns, soil Ps, soil Ks estimated. That is all it does. Uh, I just want to quickly say that because next we will have one more session and and to go through the module. One more one more module is there and that module is now taking for the target area, knowing the soil in the PK, know, and, and getting the fertilizer types, some prices, and 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 uh, investment capacity, and all these things together, how we are generating the fertilizer recommendation and the price optimization is embedded within this step, within this module. Thank you very much, <laughs> and have a good afternoon further. <laughs>